Welcome everyone to the Royal Court Theatre. We're incredibly excited to have a bunch of really uh, important guests with us tonight. Um, my name is Gabriella Coleman. I'm an anthropologist who has uh, dedicated many years of her life to studying anonymous. And today we're going to be hearing from, let's see, four of its ex-members. And what we're going to do to start is have everyone introduce themselves with their name and their alias. So why don't we start with you? I'm Jake Davis. I use the online alias Topiary. Uh, Mustafa al -Nassar. I my alias was Tifa. And I'm Ryan Ackroyd. I pretend to be a 16-year-old girl called Kayla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about how the evening is going to proceed and some um, other kind of elements about the evening. First of all, um, we're on Twitter, the Royal Court is. So if you have any comments, uh, please tweet at at Royal Court. And the hashtag is pound the big idea and pound uh, the internet, but it's spelled T-E-H, uh, internet. I'm going to be asking questions of, of these fellows. Um, and about uh, 15 minutes towards the end, I'll be opening it up to questions uh, from the audience. So one of the things about Anonymous, uh, for those that may not know, Anonymous is really filled with a lot of weird accidents. Even the birth of Anonymous, in some ways, is quite accidental. Anonymous was known for pranking and hell-raising, and today it's known for activism. So one of the big questions, really, is how people got to Anonymous, how they stumbled within this odd realm. Yeah, I think I found my way into Anonymous completely accidentally via the game of Tetris. Uh, I, was, I was literally playing a game of Tetris in 2010, late 2010, with my friend, and she sent me this URL to a, a chat room. And she said, there's 12,000 people in this chat room taking down PayPal, Visa, and MasterCard in protest of funds being withdrawn from WikiLeaks. And so I said, well, that's completely nonsensical. There's no way a chat room can have that many people mobilizing in this ridiculous fashion. My experience with sort of anonymous activism 4chan before had always been these sort of really disorganized trolls messing around for no apparent reason and going absolutely nowhere. So I decided to join this chat room just to mess with them a little bit and just to sort of laugh at the cliches of it, oh, you're protesting, you're pretending to be this hive mind thing. Um, and it was sort of working. Everyone was strangely organized, and it was getting a lot of attention. And it, and it continued, usually the, the sort of attention span is three or four days, and then everyone decides to completely disregard what they're doing and go watch YouTube videos of cats or whatever else is interesting at the time. And um, it continued for many weeks, and I just ended up accidentally staying in the chat room instead of closing it, and uh, ended up getting, getting involved in a more um, involved in a more operational level under the alias Topiary, which I, I chose arbitrarily based on a, a film by a director called Shane Carruth, who just made a time travel, sort of an amazing, fantastic time travel film called Primer, and his next film was Atopiary. So I used the nickname um, on Internet Relay Chat, and it just happened to be the one I was using, and I, I stuck with it and ended up staying in there. Well, why don't we hear from uh, Kayla next? Because one of the interesting things about Ryan slash Kayla uh, is that he was around when Anonymous was known as the Internet Hate Machine. Uh, that was the name that Fox News gave Anonymous. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got to the hate machine um, and what the hate machine uh, was all about? Um, well, back before um, Anonymous started making news, like hitting websites like PayPal, MasterCard, with DDoS attacks and stuff like that. It used to be an underground group that, that went by the name The Insurgency. It was, um, it was a board on a website known as uh, 7chan. And it was a small group of people that basically signed up to websites, flooded fo forums with shock images, gore, dead bodies and things like that, just to like, provoke a reaction and things like that. And then it went on to... Like, a guy named uh, Hal Turner in America, a racist, um, basically had a racist video, um, radio show where people called in and commented about people of race. And it turned out that one of the people from Fortune had called his website and he, um, he found out the phone number of this. Uh, he was about 14, 15 year old, just a, just a kid who prank called his radio show just to wind him up. And he posted his phone number of this kid online saying basically, 
asking the, uh, like the Ku, Ku Klux Klan and other Nazi groups to go to his house, firebomb his house, and like run him out of town and basically things like that. So everyone on the, um, on the insurgency on, the, on 7chan decided to shut this guy's radio show down, basically, and he got hit with a lot of DDoS attacks. Boxes, useless things sent to his house. Lots of dildos, lube, yeah, <laughs> yeah. His website hacked, yeah, and his phone, everything. And he, he got a lot of abuse for a long time. And um, it came out that he was actually an FBI informant working for to, to out um, people of like racist organizations and things like that. And ever since then, I, I just stuck with it and just just continued what I was, what I was doing. Maybe we'll hear from um, Mustafa Tiflo next because he entered anonymous in a very, very interesting uh, period and he'll tell us about it. Yeah, so I first really stumbled upon to it um, around late 2010 when I read an article um, about an operation they were doing called Operation Payback. And Operation Payback was an online operation to support file sharing on the internet. And it was a ret retaliation to an Indian software company called iPlex which decided to take copyright laws into their own hands by DDoSing websites that refused to take down copyright infringing content like the Pirate Bay. So Anonymous decided to retaliate to that by actually giving Apex a taste of their own medicine and DDoSing them back. And in the article, there was a link to the IRC channel, which was, had about 300 people in there. And that's where it really kicked off for me. Darren? Um, pretty much around the same story as T-Flows, I mean, I was doing my own thing and then heard about the Operation Payback supporting Pirate Bay. And I thought, well, I'll get in this and just took it from there. Just kind of took a life of its own. So one of the interesting things about Anonymous is that there's been over 250 operations in the last number of years. And, and the operations can take very different formats. Some of them involved a lot of hacking. Some of them involved uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Some of them just involve organizing street protests. Some of them involve all three different modalities. So one of the things I'm interested in hearing is um, what our uh, guests tonight um, think some of the more important anonymous operations were and why. Sure. Um, Certainly, February 2011, when uh, countries, I think Tunisia, Zimbabwe, were censoring various parts of the internet, and Tunisia especially blocking activists' Facebook and censoring and spying on them, and code was sort of implemented to, uh, again, uh, take login details from activists' Facebook and block them from using it entirely, and sort of actually Mustafa, um, I always refer to you here as you wrote a fantastic piece of code to counter their government's piece of code so that activists, uh, citizens of Tunisia could use it, and it would basically override um, the government's own censorship of the website, allowing them to freely use social networking again, and sort of setting up chat rooms for those people and allowing them a platform to uh, share their video, share their thoughts, and to sort of send them um, first sort of survival kits, yeah. how to survive on the streets. That was definitely one of the most more interesting operations because we actually had people within inside Tunisia actually approaching Anonymous for help. And I mean, that was probably the operation, the only operation where it was, it was a legitimate form of protest and nothing illegal happened. It was just writing code. It wasn't hacking, it wasn't DDoSing. So that, that was an extremely productive operation. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, all them, they're, they're a different, they were different what had gone on before. They were more productive. They weren't per se taking down something. They were trying to yeah. Somebody. So part of Anonymous is quite serious, right? We just heard about Tunisia. Um, they were really helping people on the ground. Um, lives were on the line. But even as Anonymous became very uh, serious, they really still embraced humor. So I want to know or hear about some of the funniest things that happened uh, during your tenure with Anonymous. I think the funniest operation by far was the Westboro Baptist Church hack where they were actually, so, so Jake was doing an interview with the Westboro Baptist Church on radio, on live radio. You want to say who the Westboro Baptist Church is? Okay, well, the, where the Westboro Baptist Church is a sort of a homophobic uh, religious group in America, and they sort of, they protest at the funerals of dead soldiers, and they provoked the ire 
the IRA of Anonymous. Um, they sort of provoked Anonymous to hack them, I guess because they really like publicity, so it was a way for them to get publicity. But they did actually end up getting hacked for real um, on a live t radio show. Yeah, they're yeah. an unwise interview to give. Yeah, but they were, they were, um, <laughs> they sort of, they sort of, they, they're, they're an interesting, I wouldn't describe them as such, I'd say they're more of a, a disgusting cult. Um, they sort of profit from the negative publicity they get by filing lawsuits, because it's a family of lawyers essentially, by filing lawsuits against the people that come out to their protests and protest against them. Um, you know, they sort of yeah. pick at the uh, funerals of dead soldiers with just horrific homophobic racist signs, and then anyone that sort of fights against them. Well, there's one guy that drove by and threw a rock at them, and he got sued, and it funds their flights to protest more, and it's sort of this yeah. insane cycle. That was definitely one of the more interesting uh, operations, interesting yeah. events of, uh, so I guess, how we, Mustafa and I, who we first sort of met online was, was via that at any meaningful level. Yeah, yeah, that's not really true. I, used, I think I first approached you to write press releases, didn't I? No, I remember yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that particular. So maybe talk a little bit about some of the different um, roles you played in Anonymous and the different type of work that you did uh, while you participated. Uh, yeah, well, basically, I mean, a lot of the times when um, Anonymous attack websites, they use, like, DDoS attacks, which is basically just requesting a website over and over and over again until... The website cannot handle that many requests and it denies like service and access to legitimate users but it only works so far and it's, it's easy to DDoS a website and I took more joy in actually penetrating the web server, defacing the website, stealing the emails and any other like confidential information that I could but most of the time when I tried to do this to a lot of websites they were down due to DDoS, and I, I couldn't actually hack them because, <laughs> because they was down, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but a lot of sites could have gone down as well. <laughs> well, if you're part of political movements where you're uh, hacking and breaking the law, invariably there will be snitches and informants. And in Anonymous, there was a very famous one who went by the name of Sabu. And so a question I have is uh, when you all started to suspect or not that there was an informant uh, within your ranks. And then I've, I've taken some questions from Twitter. Um, and one of the questions was, do you want to have a beer with Sabu? Mm. <laughs> I don't know, personally, I'd have a beer with anyone involved in the case, uh, prosecution, or the judge of Sabu. Um, sure. Um, maybe, maybe not a friendly beer with Sabu. We'll see. Um, I guess uh, I certainly first started to suspect someone within the group was uh, either an um, ongoing informant or had sort of other agendas in mind just based on the language in uh, even simple, we were using chat rooms to talk basically, very simple medium. And being around each other for that long, we sort of build up a, a, an image based on that text of, of what, how someone is thinking and acting. Is, you have very little to, to go on. So sort of the language he started to use was more extreme. And it was, there were a lot more questions, as in um, uh, the FBI's instructions were obviously ask them this question so they respond with this, so you can say this, so they incriminate themselves with this. Sort of asking us to assert certain things that we all already either allegedly knew to be true, and then making us say them again and again um, for very little reason. So that was uh, several weeks before we were all taken down. Yeah, I, I personally never did suspect that he was an informant. Well, he was, because I think he was like very smart socially. He, he was very manipulative, and he knew how to handle himself socially. So he was a bit of an actor, anyway. Mm. Yeah. It's actually interesting when many of you guys were arrested and taken away. Lulsec kind of transformed to become Antisec, a kind of militant uh, political hacker group. And Sabu was very important. And there was another um, hacker by the name of Jeremy Hammond, who has received a 10-year sentence in the United States. And uh, just sort of echoing what um, Mustafa said, um, anti-sec hackers didn't uh, suspect Sabu for a very long time. He was, he was quite good at, at what he did. He was quite successful. Uh, but eventually his name was revealed, uh, which was a very big moment. And maybe we'll talk about that when, when his uh, name and face was splashed on uh, Fox News. What did you guys think? What, what, well, what reaction do you have <laughs> at that moment? Well, when his name was revealed, it was about a year after I was arrested. So any emotions or feelings that I had about that time were pretty much non-existent anymore. So I pretty much felt nothing 
about the fact that it was only four months. I just, I really didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. <laughs> it was a bit surprising. I mean, Sabu was always kind of like, he'd always refer to you as, as um, you're my family, you're my brother. You know, he'd be like, I think a common thing he'd say is, oh, I've mad respect for your brother. You're all like my family. And, you know, he was, you know, he'd, dry, he'd draw you in a lot. And he'd made, the, he'd made the point of calling you his brother, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's just like a sort of tight family, we're all in this together, but we basically yeah. translate to co-conspirators. Um. <laughs> were you guys a family? Were things really tight among uh, the hackers, the LulzSec hackers? What was it like? What was it like to kind of collaborate with each other? Did you kind of have a desire to know about uh, what you were really doing outside of, of the internet? How did you manage the fact that you couldn't share personally identifying information with each other? Since quite, I find, I've always found that online as a certainly growing position, quite liberating, not to be able to, because I think, well, certainly myself was living quite a mundane life at the time and wouldn't want to talk about it anyway. So because we were, I mean, invariably you go into a, a chat room online, if it's an anonymous chat room, stranger talking to stranger, someone wants to know who you are, how old you are, suddenly breaking down that level of anonymity, and we were doing the exact opposite of that. So that, yeah. that was interesting. And because we were all sort of working towards this usually common goal, um, it, it, felt, it felt quite close, as much as it can be through, through these sort of chat rooms. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't about identity. I mean, the, the only thing we had in common is, is our goal, rather than who we were, or our age, or our gender. Speaking of that, um, when Mustafa was arrested, uh, it was revealed that he was 16 years old. And I know, personally, my jaw dropped. I just did not identify him as a teenager. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about how you guys reacted when you found out that um, Mustafa had just left pre-teenhood. Um. I, I was actually impressed, to be honest, because um, <laughs> Mustafa, he, he definitely knew a trick or two. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, likewise. <laughs> yes, that's it. He was this sort of calm, brilliant programmer that I assumed to be in some mysterious, well-secured bunker um, <laughs> it, on the moon, it, possibly. At yes. least 30. <laughs> at least 30. I mean, if you, want uh, any, if, you, if you want any proof of that, you've only got to check the jester's lulz hunter. It got converted down to, what was it, three or four lines? Sure. So, and, and, uh, from, so, uh, from 50 lines yeah. of PHP down to three. <laughs> no, I think, uh, yeah, no, and then uh, sort of a posing hacker once wrote this piece of code in order to attack our websites or uh, find the, the, the networks of them. And sort of, Mustafa, you, instead of insulting his sloppy coding, you wrote a better version of his code. Yeah. <laughs> in, in about... Uh, less than 5% of the space used and just sent it back to him and go use this instead. <laughs> um, that was fine. So yeah. to know a 50, 16 year old is doing that is, is, is mind blowing. So I think a, a similar question I will pose to, to Ryan, right? Um, for a very long time, uh, Ryan was known as Kayla, 16 year old hacker, uh, wonder whiz girl, and, and, and there was big debate. You know, is, is Ryan a woman? Is it a guy? Who is she? Who is he? And then, you know, we got our answer, but I would love to hear a little bit more why you took on the persona of a 16-year-old girl. It's, uh, it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of people even thought that was a transgender, which is definitely not true. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, a couple of years, well, quite a few year, years back, when I was um, 15, 16 in 2003, um, I, used to, we, I used to be part of, a, like, a hacker group, but basically we used to hack, like, rival clans of like games and things like that. We used to like hack a lot of Command and Conquer and things like that. And we were just chilling out in, a, in, our, in, a, in, a, in IRC one day and a, and a girl called Kayla stumbled into our IRC, which is like a, it's just like an online chat room. And basically we got to know her. She, she was like our friend and we just, she used to just hang out with us. We'd talk to her, you know what I mean? But she didn't really know she, about computers. She didn't know any hacking or anything like that. And then, a couple, a couple of months later, we, we had a bit of an argument with, a, with like a rival clan, with like a rival hacker group, and they tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to hack us, and they couldn't get to us, so they sort of, they, they hacked Kayla to kind of get at us, if, if, if you understand what I mean. They, they kind of just like saw us as a, as a soft target, 
but because we, we were, we're that good friends with her, we all, we, we, it's like she left the internet, they, they, they ruined her, killed her computer, her dad's bank accounts, everything, put her house up for sale, cut her off her electric and everything, basic, like, you know, just like life ruining tactics and things like that. So we all thought, well, we'll take revenge in Kayla's name. So we all assumed Kayla's name and we went after these people, we hacked them, we ruined them, we did what they did to her, basically to them. And eventually we, we built up a reputation as Kayla and Kayla had, had like a bit of a reputation online of being like someone that you just did not mess with and, it, and eventually it started out like Kayla was five people to begin with and over time people just like just left and did, did other things just went different ways but I, I kept on the name and then I, I kind of like joined Anonymous during the whole like Hal Turner saga which and I, it's just stuck ever since then and I've always pretended to be a 16-year-old girl online. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Thanks for that. Um, well, everyone here has uh, received a knock on the door uh, from the Garda, from the, from the Metropolitan Police. Probably there was more than one. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that was like and also perhaps give us a sense of, of your life at the time? Um, what was it like to kind of be living as you were participating in Anonymous? I'm sure you didn't spend all your time uh, typing away at the keyboard. And this, this is a question for everyone. Okay. Yeah. I did spend all my time on the keyboard, basically, at that point. <laughs> all of it, um, which, which is, a, yeah, it was a very sort of mundane existence, not leaving my house at all. Um, so I had these uh, very vague images of uh, having heard of people, and certainly in the States, being, having their houses raided before, of doors being smashed through, people with guns, you know, just at least 12, 20 officers, right, yeah. Um, but no, it was just a friendly knock on my door, which I assumed was my neighbor complaining about the music levels being too loud. Um, and I sort of opened the door and there were six sort of plain clothed metropolitan police officers and a Scottish sheriff, because I was arrested in Scotland and needed to go fire a Scottish sheriff to get there. So he was there as well, quite delighted um, at this level of operation he'd been, he'd been sucked into. Um, and they, you know, it was a polite knock. They said, are you Jake Davis? Yes, uh, I'm arresting you on conspiracy to commit distributed denial of service attack against a serious organized crime agency. Sort of just walked me back into my hallway, just flooded in and started ripping up um, cases with games in them, checking out my computer, taking old memory cards from old games consoles. But with no, no guns and no handcuffs. Almost a sort of uh, quiet, intimidating sarcasm, like this is just what we do. We just take down little nerds all, all day online. And <laughs> you're nothing special and you're gonna go, which I think is, far more effective than coming in guns blazing because it has that sort of, oh wow, this, they don't care about this as much as I thought. Um, that, that, was, that, was the, that was the sort of experience that they and loaded me onto a, a sort of jet, a four seat load jet, so I had me wheel with these huge sort of devices, my evidence in giant tubs. So computers being wheeled onto this plane across a, a sort of empty runway, which was quite a surreal moment. Um, and they finished performing the forensics of my computer while in the air, in the plane, uh, just before the battery ran out. Um, so they were worried they'd lose some data if it completely. So they were, they were sort of taking uh, images of the drive, doing a, a ram dump of the system while the plane was taking off. And we touched down in London from the Shetland Islands later that day. Um, I was held in the holding cells until being released on bail. Anyone else want to jump in? A similar, similar story. It was just a few police officers in plain clothing knocking on the door. Uh, are you Tifo? Well, I didn't ask the question is because it was that a lawyer. But yeah, they pretty much came, came in, tore apart my room. I was just sitting in my room for about three hours while I watched them search, search my whole room for evidence, for USB sticks, anything like that. And you know, they, they kept asking me questions in, in, in my room, like, what is, this paper? what is this piece of paper? Yeah. I got that one a lot. What is this piece of paper? Was it was yeah. a big one? Like it was, the, it the was, least important yeah. non-electronic device. Yeah. <laughs> what, is what, is this? <laughs> what does this note mean? This is my. This is what I wanted to buy from the shop. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Best kind of password is milk and crisps. A password. Milk and crisps. <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> Don't say that. When they uh, they were looking in your in your fish fingers for USB sticks, weren't they? <laughs> they did go through the, the fish fingers in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> That was the all that was in there, so it looked a bit suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
speaking of which, um, there was a period of time where you were not allowed to talk to each other, right? Um, and when that period ended, there was a reunion here in London. Uh, you guys went out to play video games and, and eat Thai food. Uh, an interesting thing happened that, that day. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so we had this. So after Jake was able to speak to us, we had, we had a sort of like a little reunion in London where all the ex star tech people would hang out. Um, and there was this one time when we were in the park and a random person came up to us asking us questions about computer software <laughs> in the park. <laughs> and it was sort of like a, he, he was sort of pretending to be drunk and he, thought, he looked a bit like a police officer with a sort of like a military haircut. What a police and officer's a, face. Yeah, very police officer's face. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so he started asking us about computer software in the park, and then he started asking Darren, what are you doing? Are you cracking passwords? And it was literally, are you stealing people's passwords? Yeah. And I was like, lol, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his, knowledge of, his knowledge escalated incredibly. So he first approached us on the street, and we were playing a little bit of music and pretended to be a little bit rowdy and drunk with this can of Coke that he was somehow getting very drunk on. And then offered... He helped drag the, the music sound system, so he was very helpful under cover of it. Yeah. Um, and then sort of, sort of sat sitting in this park having a drink, and he started asking about the specific types of software that was quite specific as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, then he had this magical tool we needed to charge our phones, and he happened to have this sort of device that could charge phones. So don't go plug your devices into this thing. And then while at the same time sort of circling and asking the current price of MDMA, yeah. <laughs> not, not, do you have MDMA? Just what is the going rate at the moment for it? While yeah. two seconds later asking about uh, if you're cracking passwords or not. Yeah. <laughs> not exactly subtle. Um, all right. You know, there were a number of questions that came from Twitter that have to do with questions of, of regret. Do you feel guilty about anything? Do you regret anything um, in terms of your participation with Anonymous? That, that seemed to be a kind of recurring question, so I'll throw that out there. Um, regrets? <laughs> it's a tough one. Well, regrets, in a sense, you can feel a bit guilty about stuff and you can regret stuff, but in the end, regrets a bit pointless. What's done is done. You can't go and take it back. So you can feel sorry for, you know, the ones that you feel sorry for, but there's no point thinking too hard about it because it happened, it's in the past, <laughs> You know, yes, there are some things. I think we'd all agree that the people whose usernames and passwords got leaked, they definitely didn't deserve it. You know, they trusted companies with absolutely disgustingly bad security with their personal d data. And then when those companies got targeted and their stuff got leaked, they became almost, per se, collateral damage in a sense, where they got hurt more than the company. So, you know, they. You do feel awful sorry for them because you heard we saw via Twitter a lot of people abusing Amazon accounts and such like. Absolutely. And on top of that, sort of similar to myself, the language sort of that was used at the time, you know, sort of the way in which we engaged this sort of stuff, being part of that, uh, being sort of part of the anonymity, the sort of chat room culture, you have to sort of have this sort of stoic, extreme language about you, otherwise, you just get turned on immediately. So we sort of had to continuously play this ridiculously hardcore role that was so distant from our actual selves, um, constantly 24-7, until the point where it sort of consumes you a little bit. So to be ripped away from that is, uh, and to, to give in the space of a few years to sort of reflect on, on some of that was, that was difficult. So I'm going to ask one more question before turning it to the audience. Um, so start thinking about your questions. Um, I guess my question is, what is anonymous and why is it important? I think you should answer that, Gabriel. <laughs> no, I'll, okay. I'll have you guys. Maybe I'll chime in there at the end. Okay. Well, I, thought, I can't define anonymous. It's, it's very difficult to define. You can't define it as an organization. You can't describe it as a group. I guess you could, I guess you could describe it as a movement or a sort of banner. For, it's, a, it's a banner for activists to, to use. I think it's useful as a, as a theme online. You see a lot of people going online with an ignorance of where their data ends up, but also sort of an uncaring. We, we, sort of, we don't mind if our data is being used by Facebook for a psychological experiment or being sold to the CIA, etc. cetera. Um, people have that, that attitude that you know, they're not doing anything wrong, so we'll just have cameras installed in your showers then or something. But it's, um, 
I think I think it's good as as that sort of as that sort of theme as that sort of benchmark. Certainly, when young people are using the net and they're worried about, because uh, I think young people now growing up are sort of learning from our mistakes, and how when you put something online, it is there forever, essentially, virtually there forever. So we see a lot of use of uh, what people see as temporary chat platforms like Snapchat, uh, secrecy apps. Um, and I think that that's reflects what Anonymous sort of was in the early 2000s and coming into the, the late 90s. A lot of people have that, have that savvy now. Um, whether, whether Anonymous did good or bad, because it's done both, because it's so nebulous, um, it's sort of solidified now as that, as that benchmark for protecting yourself online. And I think a lot of I think people growing up need to, need to take more caution. I mean, I'll just jump in briefly, because I do think that there's uh, so many different elements that are amazing about on Anonymous. And, you know, one of them has to do with, um, you know, the, the gathering of people that we have here tonight. Um, you know, if they weren't pseudo-anonymous or anonymous, maybe they would never come together. And there's very different types of people um, that do come together under the banner. Uh, weirdly enough, many of the hackers are from UK and Ireland, uh, and that's maybe a question, why, why is that so? Um, I think another element as well is that if if you can find the right conditions, um, people do want to protest and, and make the world a better one. And the fact that Anonymous went from these kind of hell raisers to, um, you know, these insurgent activists, I think is a very interesting and hopeful and important story as well. And finally, I'll just mention the fact that um, in Anonymous, it really is frowned upon to seek uh, self-promotion and, and fame. You're really doing it for the kind of group. Uh, and that is, I think, a really amazing lesson uh, that Anonymous has, has put forward to the world. So why don't we open it up to the audience? Uh, there's questions down there, right there in the corner. Uh, there's a microphone coming. Well, this is um, not self-promotion, uh, but I represented Nerdo, who was one of the administrators of Operation Payback, and he was the only person in that particular trial, which was conspiracy to... Um, use uh, uh, unauthorized access to computers with the intent to impair them. He pleaded not guilty and he gave evidence. So he's the only person we've heard in court explaining what the operation was about. And in answer to a question, he said that DDoSing is digital sit-in. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. I think, I think it's digital sit-in if the people, if the, if the computers that are doing the DDoS attack are controlled by voluntary users out of their own will rather than using a botnet, I really don't see any difference to that and a, a, a real life sitting as long as, it's, as long as the people who are doing it are doing it voluntarily and not because they have a virus or botnet on their computer. So it depends a little bit on which aspect of the website is being specifically targeted. I remember the Nodo case very well. Um, does the website have a, a payment server or a user login server or, a, or just a home page that would sort of uh, be considered in some of the, the same as sort of graffitiing uh, something on the front door? Um, so it's, it's all about it on a case-by-case -case basis which, which area is targeted and why. Because um, the website is not just, I, I guess there was just one, one space, one URL. Another question? Um, how about the woman in the third row? Sarah? Okay. You mentioned about people giving away data free willy to sort of Facebook and companies when you're entering competitions. When do you think the tipping point is going to be when people realize they're actually giving away too much and actually what could the consequences ultimately be? I think. For most people, it's probably when their stuff, I mean, it's probably a bit sad, but most people, it's when their stuff gets leaked online, then they start to a bit of think about how much they're giving away, or when their privacy gets grossly invaded. Most people don't stop to think about it until then. <laughs> yeah, it's stuff like that, high-profile stuff that gives people pause for thought. I think most people don't care. I mean, Facebook's entire business model relies on gathering as much information about you as possible so they can sell you good, ad relevant adverts. But I think... I found that a common person on the street doesn't really care as long as Facebook is simple to use. So I think we'll only really start solving that problem once we have 
user-friendly um, alternatives for people to use. Other questions? How about on the second row, the fellow with the white shirt? Hi. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just had a very... I was just wondering, you know, all in all, what you thought was the purpose of the internet. It might be a really big question, but fundamentally you are challenging the purpose which uh, Facebook feels um, internet is there for, or Google. Uh, you have your own view of what that purpose is, so I'd like to understand it better. Do we all agree on this? It's, uh, it's designed solely for the transmission of pictures of cats. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's definitely it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other use for the internet. <laughs> no. And learning, I suppose. Learning as, as much as you possibly can with as few clicks as possible. And having that knowledge base that you're... Well, it's still reading a book is lovely. Um, all about we should try and do that. sharing information and access to information. It's, um, it's a lot better these days with the internet for people to research something that they want to learn without having to pay thousands upon thousands in college fees and things like that. I mean, everything that I learned to do with hacking, reverse engineering, I learned online just from reading online books, online text, and I never spent a penny doing it. How about uh, sort of in the middle, a uh, woman in the grey sweater? Um, after having spent so much time being anonymous, how did it feel seeing personas of yourselves on stage? Um, and how did you feel about other people interpreting your actions um, and your kind of twitches, I guess? I found it... I've seen the show a few times now, and at, at first it's, it's incredibly surreal given the fact that, because as you say, it's an online persona being fictionalized, um, never really given, I don't know, but he was never really given much thought to how I perceive my own online persona looking back at it. Because even that itself, the real online persona seems alien. So to see it visualized as a person performing it is even more alien. And I think as surreal as it is looking past that, it, it acts as a, a fantastic prism to tell the wider story of the mystical, colourful, weird, insane internet with, the, with ball pits. Um. Well, for me, to me, in, in a way, it just sort of feels like watching another play because everything in this play is, was based on things that we typed into a chat room a few years ago. And this is a sort of physical representation of it. So to me, it just feels something completely original and new that I've never seen before. Sometimes I don't, some, in a way, sometimes I don't recognize it. And for many of us who were watching Anonymous very closely, it really felt like a play um, for, for, for a very long time. And so I love the fact that um, the royal court decided to make a play because there's a really nice affinity between what happened with Anonymous and theater in general. Um, I think we have enough time for one or two more questions. Oh, so many. Um, I'm going to let, let's see there in the corner. Hi, yeah. So uh, um, I go back to the Habbo Hotel and uh, how Turner hacks, um, not hacks, but raids and stuff. And I was wondering, a lot of people have asked me about the bad language used, uh, the racism and the homophobia. And I've always postulated, you know, once I actually talked to people about it, and you guys made a call to actually admit <laughs> that we are part of something called Anonymous, um, that we'd actually devalued the offence of these terms uh, by generalising these terms uh, I, I can't even say them out loud, even though I've used them a million times online. I was wondering if you agreed, or if you think those terms are just as, as, uh, as offensive as ever. Um, online, in the context they're used in online, those words have literally absolutely no, mean, no connotation with the, the stigma that would be attached to them in real life. In real life, certain terms cause great offence. Online, those words are just the vernacular that's used to an outsider, they're like, oh my god, these guys are the most homophobic, racist, whatever. They're, they don't understand the culture that's there. It's an entirely separate culture where those words have no meaning. They're just noise. 
They're just characters on a screen. Any po opposing views? No, that, that being said, well, I agree in some cultures. That the internet's also, a, unfortunately, a fantastic platform for actual people that are racist and are homophobic and are misogynistic to post this sort of nonsense online. And so I think outside of that is a serious issue. Um, social media, especially, especially we're looking at the celebrity photo leaks, where, where there's an encryption issue there. And there's also an issue of these were all high-profile female celebrities. And there is that sort of culture there where this, it's sort of this, these naked pictures are seen as Pokemon cards to some people, and then they're sort of gamifying it. And it becomes quite, quite horrific and quite scary in that sense. I think some issues to be dealt with it outside of that. How about a question, the woman on the, like, with the striped shirt, the, the yes. Would you, would you change anything? And if you would, what would you change? Related to anonymous or? Yeah, more to what you guys did. <clears throat> would you do it all over again? Is basically the question. It's an impossible question. It's, it's, an impossible it's a definitely question. an impossible question. It's an impossible question, yeah. It's the same, it's the same as asking, do you regret it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's impossible yeah. to answer, really. Yeah. Yeah, of course. From regretting. Wanting to do it again, but what would you change to whether you want to get caught or not? But just and maybe another wrinkle or twist is what has anonymous added to your life as well? I mean, you guys were participating <laughs> hardcore. Are they still doing it? Well, <laughs> they can't answer that. No incrimination allowed on the stage. Well, no crime here. <laughs> <laughs> But what has Anonymous added to your life in some ways um, now that there's a bit of, of distance to reflect on that? Oh, and firstly, to answer that, well, I think the fact that we are here on stage rather than hunched over computers in our bedrooms uh, shows that we're, we're sort of, we're, we're not doing anything. We haven't been for human. We've all, we've all been sort of sent to, sent to jail <laughs> and prosecuted and had our internet taken away from us, certainly most of us often. And um, Ryan, we're banned from the internet for two straight years, given a home detention curfew, um, and sort of had our lives in various ways destroyed. So I think we'd be incredibly, the most, the largest fool would sit up here and continue to do what we did. Um, but w w what Anonymous has added to my life, so certainly my life is, is that top bath and bottom bath for the extremes. Um, sort of growing up was struggling to find my place and find role models and anti-role models. And Anonymous provided both of those things because it's so extreme either way. So it's sort of a good, good way to level yourself up and, to, and the internet in general in that sense, to learn as much as possible so you can learn more about yourself. You want to comment? Yeah, well, I'll just go back to the, the, the question that the lady asked today. And would, would we regret anything? Would we change anything? I, I can't speak for everyone else here, but I can speak personally. And a lot of, um, a lot of the time, like, there was a lot of polit political reasons behind some of the things that happened, like stuff with Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and some things in this country as well with like um, privacy acts like ACTA, SOPA, and the, all, all those that have been trying to be like passed into law to like make like protect like copyright and things like that. But basically, it, it allows governments to to like spy on the p privacy of of people and things like that. And a lot of the times, it's been opposed online using web attacks, DDoS, hacking, life ruin tactics, things like that, ruining someone's bank accounts and stuff like that. And if I could change anything, and I reckon I'd like to see Anonymous take on more of like a, a legitimate political role and actually try and do change legally rather than, because there's a, there's a lot of the mem members of Anonymous, there's lawyers, people who work in banks, police, military and I'm sure that there's um, the brains and the knowledge to come together and actually affect change legally. Well, yeah, if. well, since the internet is serious business and that was a very nice serious uh, statement, we'll end there, but as a nice contrast, there's going to be a lot of fun that's going to follow with the play, so please join me in thanking all the ex-anonymous members who were so wonderful in answering the questions.